What's Frankenstein got to do with this? Can Rick be persuaded to like old style aircraft? And why getting lost is getting harder. You're watching fullflap.tv. If you didn't know, it's illegal to take off with too much weight in an aircraft. And it's especially illegal if that extra weight is bags and bags of marijuana. Not that that stopped people trying to smuggle with microlites from Mexico into the USA over the past year. As I mentioned before, one's died, another was paralysed after hitting power lines, and the third was just arrested. Probably the best result of all three. It's called weight and balance, guys. You've got to hand it to the Chinese. They don't do things by halves. Inspired to do a little aviation, the Hunan Sunwood Science and Technology Company Limited is looking to spend $60 million on 15 unmanned aerial vehicles, 70 flying boats, and 15 new two-seater light aircraft. And they even have a catchy name for the project, the development and industrialization of light aircraft. Wow. All the research and ideas are their own, apparently. Frank Robinson knows how to get aviation buzzing and how to terrify anyone else who makes a helicopter. He's been showing off the R66 to everyone and not surprisingly it's gone down rather well. It's a five-seater with enough luggage room to carry the whole of Hunan Technology Company. Coming up, the flight school that keeps more than a casual eye on its students, but first. Rick, our producer, is not a huge fan of historic aircraft, so being the kind of people we are, we set him up with Paul Redlinger from Fisher Flying Products to see if Paul could persuade him otherwise. A lot of your aircraft have got that sort of classic look, haven't they? Um, yes. Bit historic. Are they not sort of a bit past it? Uh, I don't think they're they're past their time. There's always a, a place for classic airplanes in uh, in the aviation industry, and uh, a lot of the builders like building something unique. And uh, you, know, you don't go out to the field and find many tiger moths sitting around. And it gives them a chance to be able to fly a, uh, a unique historic aircraft that's uh, made with mostly modern materials, uh, mostly wood and aluminum. But uh, it gets them out in the field for a reasonable cost. So you've basically got the old flying experience, but let's put it bluntly, rather safer because it's a modern aircraft, yeah? Correct, and also for much less price. Uh, you know, a Tiger Moth, because they're so few and far between, very expensive. They aren't the fastest. They, they cruise at about 100 miles an hour uh, at most, but they're not, uh, they're, they're not the type of plane where if you're in a rush to get there, uh, you take one of our planes. They are there for the sheer pleasure of flying, going out and, and uh, flying low with their open cockpit so you can smell all the smells around you and everything, and it's, it's a fantastic sensation. I've got to admit, there's one right behind you at the moment that I'm looking at. You've got a biplane on your wall behind you, and that looks spectacular. You, you don't get many biplanes. What's, what's the enjoyment of flying a biplane? It's, uh, you know, the, the one behind me, the green one, is, is our celebrity, uh, is the model name of it. It is uh, a very economical way of getting into a classic airplane, and you get that open cockpit feeling, and when you land, the airport comes running over and checks your plane out, you have a hard time getting where you're wanting to be. More on that in a second. So, you're off on your first cross-country training flight. You've been told to go somewhere, but you really fancy taking a look at something on the way. In the past, it was easy, but now your instructor might start asking you why you went off and did 20 orbits around an outdoor swimming pool. A flight school in New Zealand has installed GPS trackers in its new fleet of diamond aircraft so that instructors can see if their students get lost, into trouble, or just plain distracted. Show news, and it's ironic that while America invented the most wonderful thing to happen to aviation in many years, the light sport aircraft class, it's the Eastern Europeans who seem to be making most of them. We've said it before, but this is why we're going to Aero Expo. We want to know what you want to know. Is it what's coming next? Is it who's the cheapest? Or the other way round? What do you want to know from them? We're not afraid to ask. Let me know. The event is in Prague in May, and if you can make it, there's that big entry discount if you register on their website. Dr. Frankenstein seemed to be on the right track when he used electricity to power things. Toyota agreed and then mixed it into a hybrid engine in the rather dull looking Prius. I think you know where I'm going with this and it's true. Someone is going to do the same with an aircraft. 
Luckily, this won't be an embarrassment to technology as it's going to be put in the very good looking LSA, the CT. The big announcement comes at the Aero Show in Friedrichshafen next month, but I can tell you now it will only produce about 40 extra horsepower. That should make takeoff quicker, keeping those people at the end of the runway who bought their house there last year from trying to shut the airfield down. It should also make climbing quicker too. The other good thing is that if your engine did fail, you'd be able to glide about two to three times further than normal. The firm hoped to have it installed within a couple of years. There's no word on prices yet. Up next, can you tell me the maker of this jet? But first, let's get more of that interview with Paul from Fisher. Let's talk about building kits. Now, I'm going to have to play a bit devil's advocate here because I don't have a lot of patience in life. Now, why would I build a kit? There are a number of reasons that you'd build a kit. One, obviously, is, is cost. Uh, building the plane yourself, you're putting your own labor into it, so uh, it, it's much more. But a bigger reason is a lot of our customers uh, our, our uh, older uh, people, some retired, some uh, just getting on and they want a hobby and they want something to do. And the advantage with, with our kits being wood, most people have some experience with wood. They've got the basic simple kits of uh, 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 the, the tools of a table saw or a band saw and a big working space. Uh, so they're comfortable working with the materials. So uh, you know, they've got a hobby and, and in the end of it, they can uh, come up with a beautiful aircraft. So how much skill would I need though to actually start working on one of your kits? Uh, you don't need a, a lot of special skills. That's one of the, the beauties of our uh, of our kits is that uh, we have full-size plans that come with the kits so it's like building a remote control airplane you roll the plans out and you can actually build right over top of the plans or use them to measure uh, and it's all basic woodworking skills it is uh, you know cutting the material all the material all the lumber is cut to size and grooved all of the uh, plywood is cut and shaped and all of the aluminum is drilled and bent so it's more of an assembly type process with uh, you know gluing it together Together with T88 uh, epoxy adhesive and uh, uh, just uh, putting the pieces together. It looks like the military is benefiting from an influx of pilot wannabes since all the trainings included. The other event we're covering this spring is the Fly Professional Flight Training Show in April and the military will be there. That said, if you still want to go commercial, then it should be good. You can get some great advice at the event from airlines and manufacturers. I'll give you some more details over the next few weeks if you can make it. And talking of jet jobs. Think of Bombardier and what do you think of? If your mind's gone blank and you're just wondering who the hell are Bombardier, well, this is what everyone else is thinking of. You don't think of big jets, do you? Well, the firm are hoping to take on Boeing and Airbus with this, the new C-Series, and to prove a point, they've sold one, even though it won't be ready until 2013. When you get to fly one, you'll find around 110 passengers behind you. Peter emailed us this week from Belgium to say he's put fullflap.tv on his website. Hi Peter, you can find the links on this week's emails if you're signed up for that. He's got a great blog on there with some very nice pictures. Also, he's got lots of information on flying in Belgium, from light aircraft to ballooning, with places to go and a calendar of local events. So have a look at this address to see what he's doing. Every pilot and wannabe pilot has done it. Fluffed what you're meant to say on the radio. Instead of November 235 request zone clearance, it's more like November... <laughs> Now, the guys at Embry-Riddle University have come up with an artificial air traffic computer system that will listen to your voice and reply correctly. The guys behind it are showing off, actually, about right now in Daytona Beach. Rick is still talking about his night flying experience in last week's show. I hope you enjoyed that. One person said the only problem was he didn't talk to air traffic control. Well, he did, but we just didn't put it in the film. And finally, I know you boys at TakeOffTube.com have been demanding it, so here we go. Hello guys. Coming up next week, every time we make a comment about an aircraft and say whether it's pretty or not, we get emails saying we're wrong, so we're having a fashion show. All the top fashion houses will be taking part, including Cessna and Boeing. It's all a bit of fun. Join us then, you're watching FullFlap.tv, and I'm Vicky Ferrer.